good. You ready on the right? Ready on the left? I don't have that. Sorry. Ready on the firing line? Yeah, All right. I'd like that. to call the uh, work session of December 4, 2017, to order. May I have a roll call, please? Here. 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 very, very important topic and then broken it down into components. And so tonight what we're going to be talking about is our demographic report and then also our facility usage report. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Haber, I just want to point out that as always we have a number of important board meetings coming up. So Monday of next week we will have our final meeting in regards to the strategic plan. Everyone is welcome to attend. That will be in this room on Monday, 7 o'clock. When we get back from the holiday break, we'll have our next referendum meeting, and that is on January 8th. So we'll continue to provide monthly meetings up until the, the March 13th referendum. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Haber. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, it is so nice to be here and finally getting to this important evening. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off by just giving an overview of how a demographic study is done, indeed what a demographic study is. So that as we go through the evening, we kind of understand the logic of what was going on. I think it's also important that um, I avoid any education ease or statistician ease or that kind of a thing, so that we're very clear on what on what, what this is all about. So I may have the first slide, please. Okay. All right, so, uh, can you guys see it? Can we dim the lights a little bit? I'm not afraid of the dark, and I trust these people back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Yes. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, what demographics is, it's, it's a study of a specific population, okay? In this, in this instance, the population are the students of, Fairl of the Fairland schools, and specifically this demographic study is to look at the enrollment, past and future, of that particular demographic. Again, those demographics being Fairland students. Now, the method that I use is called the cohort survival method. And before I tell you what that is, understand that this is required by the New Jersey State Department. This method is required by the New Jersey, New Jersey State Department of Education. What Steve Stacora, the architect, had to submit to state ed has to be a cohort survival projection. Now basically, what a cohort survival projection is, is that it follows groups of students as they move from grade to grade over a six year period of time. So for example, Let's say there were 100 students entering kindergarten in 2012. When this same group became first graders, if that group becomes 110, that's a 10% growth or a 1.1 growth ratio. So as these students move down the trail, the next slide will be a little clearer on that, 
we watch the growth and decline as they move from grade to grade. We average that over a five year, we take the six years, we average, make a five year average of those movements from grade to grade, and um, from that we then project from the last year. And again, the next slide will be a little bit clearer on exactly how this works. Now the cohort survival method only looks at the historical enrollment of the students. And by the way, it's measured year to year based on the October 15th enrollment, the official enrollment that the schools have to report to the state, state on the AASA. So that enrollment, is, that is only based on student history. It doesn't take other factors into account. The major factor that has to be added to the cohort survival method is the impact of housing in the school district. Okay? So for example, in this school district, we have a, a large development coming in the landmark development. So we have to figure out a way in an enrollment projection how to add those figures in. So what's developed is called a, a student yield ratio. In other words, in other words, how many students can be expected to come out of a particular type of house, a particular type of apartment, and a typical number and, and, and a number of bedrooms in each of these apartments. There, there historically Democracies in the past have used what was called the Rutgers study in New Jersey. And the Rutgers study was kind of the Bible of, of, of getting these yield factors up until just a few years ago. The problem with that study is that data was developed between 2003 and 2005. And the actual report was in 2006. What I found, beginning about four years ago, is that it underprojected students. It, and it underprojected students by a lot. So the method that I use is I come up with comps. I look at Similar, similar developments in similar communities, or if there were developments as such in this community, which they, they were not quite the same as Landmark, and I take a look at the average of what those developments yield over time, and they, those get added to the cohort survival study. If I may have the next page, please. So this is a sample. This is not fair one. This is the sample to explain exactly how the cohort survival method works. If you take a look, at K1 and 2, when you see those yellow boxes, those are the same groups of students as they move as they move through the grade system. So there were kindergartners in kindergartners being in uh, in 2015-16, there were 375. When that group became first graders, that group ballooned to 527, giving a 1.1.405 growth ratio. When those first graders became second graders. Uh, the, the ratio, it was 527 to 570 for 1.02. So as you can see, you average those down. This is only a two-year average. But the average between kindergarten and first grade, in this case, is 1.472. So multiply the 2017-18 kindergarten group of 414 by 1.472. Those, when they become first graders, they'll be 609. When they become second graders, they become 636. And again, this is how the cohort survival method works. To project kindergarten, we take a look at births five years prior to kids going entering kindergarten. So if you take a look at the 445 births in year 2016, I'm sorry, if you take a look at the kindergarten students in 2016 and 17, those births were in the year 2011-12, five years earlier. So you average those out to project kindergarten numbers. So that's really how, how a cohort survival pr projection works. I'm sure you may have some questions after this about that. But again, this is required by the state. It's a solid formula. Uh, hasn't changed in a lot of years and it's quite used. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. You say the births, those births that are occur in our town or are those the births that no, those births are a are, are fair one. Those are yeah. fair one. Well, They're we, done by community, by school district. Okay, but we don't know, like, people that move here after they have a child and then move here again. That's why you average it out over, the, over six years, because that begins to take, and that, that combines the cohort with the birth rates. If, by the way, if there's, and that's a really good point, it didn't happen here, but if there's a significant difference between what birth rate is yielding in your actual kindergarten, you can use an alternative method called regression analysis or a moving average. Didn't need to do it here. And um, so, and there, there were some other com complications with this too because last year was the first year we impl implemented kindergarten. So we had to balance those numbers out because it was yielding a much higher number. Okay. 
Anyway, so anyway, the, the historical enrollment of this school district, without, without landmark, without any new housing, in 2012-13, there were 4,653 total students in this district. The year opened as of October 15th of this year with 4,937 students, and the five-year projection is at 5,334. So you can see, in a 10-year in a period, the, the number of kids has gone increase by more than 800 students. Uh, in fact, from the, from the base year, 2012-13, to the current school year, there were more than 300. And going out to the um, end of the projection, there are again about close to 400. And this is without new housing coming in. Next slide, please. So, we had to take a look at how Landmark was going to impact the school district. So anyway, based upon the data that we have from the township, Landmark... Well, I'll send you the questions. We're yes. Ready. David. Remember, it, it, because it relies on historical enrollment, it's, it's every every year ca it's calculated based upon those averages. Okay, so even after three years of 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 almost like a gradual well, it's every year does every year does an increase or increase at the same rate. Okay, so every so you can have an increase of one point one in one year and one point zero one in another year. It's a matter of where the trend is going. So it's year by year. If you say, well, we've been going up on an average of 150 a year, how come we're not going up on an average of 150 yeah. Because every year is based on a different, a different uh, uh, migration ratio, a different average migration ratio. Yes? Somebody can calculate the rate of the average that we're in the five-year right? Okay, yeah. And then what? No, let me show. Can you go back one slide? Can you please go back one slide? Go back um, one more slide. Please go back one more slide. Okay. I only put up three years just so you could see it more clearly. But in the in the projections that you would have for this district, it's actually no, not in that book. We didn't put in all the tables. We'll put the tables in, we just put in charts because the tables are almost impossible to read this group. So stay with me for a minute here, okay? This would actually be six years, the base year being 2012-13, the out year being 2022-23, the current year being 2017-18. So just keep in mind, again, just a sample. So you take the cohort works 375, 527, and 570. Those are all the same kids, okay? You follow that? That these these kids in kindergarten are the same kids in first grade and the same kids in second grade. And that's what the cohort is. It follows these kids as they move through the entire school system. This is the grade to grade movement. Okay, so kindergarten, so uh, so kindergarten to first grade is a 40% increase in this particular case. In the next year, it's a 1.5. Next year after that is 1.472. We come up with five of those. We come up with five of those ratios. Okay. Then what we then do is take this this number. We multiply this number by this number to get the projected number, and that carries through the whole carries through for each grade. So. The average for, let's say, sec first to second grade is 1.044. The average for kindergarten to first grade is 1.472. But we take it through all the grades across. Okay, the five year. Yes? It's not the same data. Okay, please. The, what I'm showing up there is a sample. It's not that. I, it shows, it shows that you, okay, you know what, Ross, Ross, hold on a second. 
Yeah, uh, logistically speaking, yep. uh, most of us can hear you pretty well, uh, but we are live, okay. and we are being taped, and I don't think everybody at home can hear us, so okay. people have to come up to the podium to ask the question into the microphone. Yeah, or, you, or you can hand it, Ross can hand it the microphone. We need the microphone. Thank you. So, so my question is the 2016-17 numbers that are highlighted, 445 and 47.4, are they merely to represent the difference between the 2015-16? Where do those numbers factor in if K1 and 2 are the same kids? No, Try again. I was a teacher for 20 years, so I'm failing miserably here. Okay. They, these, a co the cohort means cohort means the same group of kids. Right. We're clear on that. Yeah. So kids who are kindergarten kids in 2015-16, that same group are first graders in 2017-18. Okay. The ratio in between represents the growth or decline of that group as they move through the system. So in other words, in, in the case of this to this, this group grew by 1.5% when they got to the next level. So that number represents growth to decline. And you average that over a five year period. Okay? So the results that you have, or the charts that you have are based upon tables that, are six, that have six years of history. Sir? No, this is not fair. Not fair. Uh, Ross, I have a question from somebody at the table. Sure. Go ahead. Mary, is that you? No. What I wanted to reiterate. Microphone, please. Oh, you guys want microphones? I simply wanted to reiterate this is not fair, okay. and this is just you showing us a method. Yes. Correct? Correct. Okay. And I probably should have used Fairlawn a little less confused. But that was a sample I had. Okay. All right, so I, I think moving on. Is, if anybody has real problems still understanding this, please, I'd be more than happy after the presentation to kind of physically show you how it works. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's move on to. Okay, so that was a slide. We reviewed this slide. Now, the next slide, okay, uh, this, this shows the impact. Oh, I'm sorry. What are you just look at the slides before, um, the charts. Yeah. Okay, so these are aggregated total enrollment. Those are, those are real enrollments. That's historical enrollment of the district. That's total enrollment, real numbers, not projected numbers. So the uh, 2012 until uh, this year. No, this, oh, this year. year. Yeah. 2017 to 18. Those are uh, six years. Real numbers. Yes. This is, yeah, these are the actual numbers. And you um, predicted those um, ratio year by year, and it will aggregate that over that, right? You right. apply this average of uh, ratio to right. every year, every year, like moving average over right. again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks. All right, so now let's go to this slide. Okay, I think that was fine, but we get to this one. <laughs> okay. All right, this shows, this shows Landmark at Radburn, the development Landmark at Radburn. There are a total of 165 units going into that are being built at, at Landmark. Of these 165 units, 132 are market rate, excuse me, and 33 are are uh, affordable. Now, the way that the way um, that, okay, so what was what I'm saying here is that the market rate apartments, the 132 market rate apartments, will yield a total of 78 students to the school district. The ratio will be 73 K-5, 68 middle school, and, and 10 9 12. The affordable apartments will yield a total of 26 students, with the aggregate being, and, and with the numbers being 4 out of 1 bedroom, 12 out of 2 bedroom, 10 out of 3 bedroom, and the number of students coming out of the market rate of 3 out of 1 bedroom, 2 out of, um, 11 out of 2 bedroom, and 64 out of 3 bedroom. The way that I that I came up with this number was to develop an average yield ratio for similar types of apartments and condos in similar communities. Uh, DFG stands for District Fact Grouping. 
Okay. So I took, I looked at apartments like that with similar DFGs to this DFGs in economic, for simple terms, an economic evaluation of a particular community. So I looked at that and I came up with, I came up with a 0.58 ratio for, average 0.58 ratio for um, uh, affordables and I think a, seven, a 0.72 for uh, affordable units. Giving us, again, a yield of a total of 104 students broken out um, K-5-73, 6-8-21, and 9-12-10. Um, uh, now keep in mind also that I've been coming here for about nine months and so far I've seen a road built in the landmark property. So I project exactly when this is coming in is difficult, but it is coming in. So what I did is I back-ended the enrollment. So when you look at the projection numbers in the next, in the next, um, the next chart, they're going to be more back ended. They're going to be more in the last three years of the projection as opposed to the first two years. So, can I go to the next table? To the next chart, please. Oh, no. Come back up. Back up. Back up. Yeah. Back up. Back up. Back up. Yeah, so um, you said that you find a similar um, developments yeah. and similar situations to get this right. out. And how many developments were these? You sampled. Well, from 15 to 20. Um, I have to tell you, okay, honest, honestly with you that my projections on housing have been about 1% over five years, margin of error 1% over five years, so I have a very high level of confidence in what I'm projecting on that. And I did it by studying all those units, I looked at Ridgewood, I looked at uh, uh, Chad, I yeah, just numbers of the communities. There's been some discussion that the three bedrooms in the new development are actually could be marketed as four bedroom. There's a flex room that's the developers have in marketing as four bedroom. So I just wonder if you included that within your comparables. The, the answer is no, and probably if that were the case, it would have a very marginal effect on the projections, uh, a, a, a negligible effect. And and uh, when I do this, I don't do anything on speculation. I do it, you know, like someone said, well, we know there's a 400 unit. Someone's thinking about a 400 <coughs> I'm not sure. I know this is going to be the paper smart, so say it. So if someone said, I think there's a 400 unit being built on the other side of town, and people said, do you include it? The answer is no. Ross, can I just can I just speak to that for a minute? I, I contacted the mayor and um, Jimmy Van Kernigan, the borough manager, and I was told that those units are three bedrooms. Yes, there is a flex room, but there's no way at this point that they can market it as a four bedroom because they're zoned or whatever the whatever the no uh, closet. Sorry, no closets. No closets. So, can you stop them from using it illegally as a fourth bedroom? Of course not. But they're being sold as three bedrooms, and I guess if somebody gets desperate, they can make it a fourth bedroom. But that's not how they're being marketed. That's not how they're being sold. And I know that on their uh, website calling it a flex room, but for the most part, the town is expecting it to be three bedrooms. And that, what people do if they move in, we can't do anything about. Okay. Next slide, please. Just, okay, so before we get to the projection based on landmark, is I just want to point out, this, these, are, these are the current attendance zones for the elementary schools. It's Moreland, Rad, uh, Radburn, Milnes, Warren, uh, Warren Point, Lincrest, Forest, and Westmoreland. Okay, this is the location of Landmark. So just so you get a get a get a perspective on where it is and how it is in relation to other, other uh, the attendance zones of the school. So this is just for point of reference. Okay, okay uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now this is this is the, the chart or the um, in, in the graph showing the change uh, based upon. Uh, based upon landmark. As you see at the end, the, we're projecting 5,441 students. So if you go to the next slide, you can see both up there. So the next slide, okay, this shows the comparison. The gray bar is, land, is without landmark. The green bar is with landmark. And as you can see, the divergence really starts as we get out, out to the further end. And in the end, the difference is going to be about 100, 110, 120 students, something along those lines. Uh, from landmark. Questions? Don't you so far? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, then moving on. Okay. Now, this is pro the next two slides, are probably the most significant slides in the presentation. So I need everybody to pay careful attention. All right. What this is showing is what this is showing is the comparison of what will happen if you remain with a K5. And the next slide is going to show what happens if you, if, when you go to a K4. So if you take a look, beginning next year, now let me, let me also preface that when I did my projections and utilization, I capped everything at 25 kids to a grade. So in other words, in other words I, that was a cap. If a classroom went to 26, even though realistically you probably wouldn't split it, it was split here, but you need to know, and there wasn't a lot of them, but you kind of need to know um, what the actual room utilization is. So if you take a look at this chart, uh, it indicates where the shortfalls are in each of the schools over the next five years. Um, so in 2018, in 2018, and that's next year, and that's before you do anything, there's going to be a shortfall of four classrooms, meaning the principals are going to have to create space to meet the needs of those kids. Uh, it could mean some small increase in class sizes. It could mean repurposing a room, but with no construction available next year, something's going to have to be done. The year after that, 2019, that shortfall becomes six. Then as we progress along and start to consider Radburn and other things, we're getting to around 10 to 11, uh, between 10 and 11, a room short, a K-5 district wide. So I think this kind of shows you the necessity of what this referendum is all about. Uh, because remember, if you don't have room, there are only two things that can happen. You repurpose room and reduce programs, or you increase class sizes. As of now, your class sizes in the district are really quite good compared to other school districts that I've worked with. Uh, but that, that is why, I think that's why the board went for this referendum and why it's important to support it. And again, it's based upon a cap of 25 kids in the class. Let's move on to the next slide. Please. Excuse me, that's taking into consideration soft borders? Borders, we're not, it, 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 it no, because, no, because soft borders aren't going to change the, the amount of rooms based on projection. I mean, you may, you could probably manipulate, you know, I've not worked on that, so I can't really address it, but I think that it's not going to have any may, just thinking about redistricting work I've done and, and just knowing the map work I've done and everything I've worked with in the district. I don't think soft borders, so it was made temporarily relieve a problem. I don't think it solves this, in my opinion. Next slide. Now, if you go to a K-4, creating the space in the middle in the middle schools, in 2018, there will be you'll have 14. If you're not doing it in 2018, but if you did, if you could, there'd be a pickup of 14 additional classrooms. Then 12, then 10, then, then 10, then 10, then 8. Of course, it becomes diminishing, a little diminishing over time because your population is getting larger. But even though I don't really believe in 10 year projections because too many things can happen, it seems to me that this is really sustainable. And if you think about it, if you think about it, in the end year, with 10, a shortfall of 10 classrooms in a K 5 and a gain of 8 classrooms in a K 4, that's kind of an, in effect. A net, a net change of 19 classrooms, in effect. Okay. So again, I think, and again, this really ties into the projections, which is why it's kind of important to project, to present both the enrollment projections and the utilization on the same night. <coughs> Question? Yes. Hold on. Hold on. The, on this chart, where we have a surplus, classrooms. Does that include, I, I read what you're saying here, it does not include full-size rooms used for instructional purposes like computer art. So we're to assume with these numbers that they will likely be filled with art and music so there won't actually be a true surplus of classrooms? No, no. I've excluded, I've excluded all of those classrooms from projection. In other words, these are general education classrooms and doing utilization study. I set aside art, music, computer, I understand specialized rooms, so they're not counted in this. I understand that. So we could, what I'm saying is we could assume then because they're not counted that these rooms will likely be filled with those. Oh, 
activities. No, there, no. These rooms will be. These rooms will be for general purpose no, and special the, education. The access rooms. I think maybe I need to move along a little, a little to look at the utilization tables to maybe explain a little better. This is saying what this is saying is I looked at each, each principal. I met with each principal. I had a utilization survey for every principal. What they did is they gave me the total number of rooms in their classroom, which we cross check against floor plans. They showed me how each room is used. And what I did was, you'll see a little, what I did was I took the current population and the future population of general ed and special ed kids. And I said, these are the rooms, these are sacrosanct. Okay? You, need, you need to educate your, your self-contained special ed kids in specifically specific size classrooms. And you need your general purpose classrooms. What I said to them is that we're not going to count rooms like art, like music. I mean, I'm, my own bias as an educator is I never want to take that away from kids, that kind of a thing. So it's excluded. Now, if, if down the road, if you didn't go to K-5, it might be necessary to repurpose some of those rooms. But that's not what I did in this study. In this study, this is just general education and, and full-size special ed classrooms. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Yes. I'm trying to understand the table you generated here. So it seems like from 19, oh, 2019, right. the kids are still um, because of the development. So we have kids, we expect kids to get fit in, right? The new kids, not just the corner part, the moving ones. And where are you going to put those children? Well, again, again, it's going to be a little more detail later on. Again, can you go back two slides, please? Oh, one slide. Go back one slide. This is saying that th these are the number of available full-size general and special education classrooms in each building. Yes. Not counting art. Not counting computer. <coughs> not counting music. Not counting any of those full-size rooms that are for specialty. So this is what we have available. You have available in every school, okay, in every school to meet the needs of general education and special education children. Yes. Based upon the historical enrollment, okay, based upon the projections between 2018 and 2022, each school, this shows what each school, the shortfall of each school of these kinds of classrooms. And going up the line, it shows it for each school. So it's looking at 2018, a shortfall of four, in 2019, a shortfall of six. In 2020, a shortfall of 11. And then a slight leveling off to a shortfall of 10 in each of those two years. Those are, if you remember when the architect made a presentation, he used the term called unhoused students. You guys don't recall that? Unhoused students doesn't mean, doesn't mean they're going to be on the street. All it means is they're over capacity. So these are, if I use 25 students in a by each grade, you would be you would have to go well over capacity in a K-5 enrollment to fill these seats. So we go. Can you go to the next slide, please? Well, I understand that. I understand that. What I'm asking here is, if you compare 2018 and 2019, and using males, you have two rooms increase and revenue of two rooms increase. And I suppose those room needed increase because of we have not. And, but if you look at this page four, we don't really see that kind of interest. I suppose the kids, you know, if, if I'm elementary school kids, they are going to distribute it from page five. No, yeah, I, I think that either I'm misunderstanding you or you're misunderstanding me. So let me go to the next slide and explain, okay? These are based on, the two slides are based on the same numbers, okay? In other words, in other words, if they so, if we're saying here we're taking the whole grade out of the elementary schools, and we're saying by taking that whole grade out of the elementary schools, we will use, we will need and use this numbers of classrooms, but they're going to be used for general and special ed students. They're just being moved over into the, into the middle school. Well, I understand that, I understand. I'm just asking, you know, I see this, um, the jump, the, you know, we expected to see some kind of like stairs there because of the landmark building. And we didn't see the same stairs over there. So, you know, my question is, are they all fifth grade students? So when we do this K-4 and they disappear from this table, 
or they are just so few students and they well, don't have the classroom? Well, no, you first of all, you got to take into account class sizes. You've got to take into account uh, that, that this term that we use, it's an education use for but it's a term we call breakage. Okay? And what breakage is, is the number of students at any particular grade level at any particular time. So, for example, you could have a school that has 26 first grade students. Yeah, I'll use the numbers here. 25 first grade students in, this, in the building. But the second grade in that building has 18. Because that's just what the population was. Then the next year is 24, and the next year is 17. So you've got to take into account when you're counting classrooms that your numbers aren't going to be steady every year. They're going to evolve, they're going to change. So again, I think that when we look at the utilization tables, it may become a little bit clearer. All this is saying is that based on the projections, if you stay K-5, you're going to have, using the same projected population, you're going to have a shortfall of the amount of classrooms that are showed up there, resulting at the end of the projection in 10. If you go to K-5, if you go to K-4, this is the number of classrooms that become, that become available. So it, you may pick up, you may pick up an open classroom in one of the school buildings. It may be possible. And that open classroom can be used to, to break up or to, to house students who may be in a shared classroom. Remember, but one of the things that the principals have to do in the school district is they've got to split classrooms because they've got to offer speech and OTPT and resource room and uh, probably a thousand, a, a thousand other th a counseling um, a child study team meetings. So the problem is that even though we may not get used all of these rooms, we may be able to restore programs properly that are currently either in small spaces, or, and I see the principals, right on, <laughs> you know, re, you know uh, restore rooms, uh, classes that are in small spaces. There was one building I was in, and, and I, I, I honestly don't remember, so it shall remain nameless, in which there was a group, small group instruction at the back end of the room, but there was, but, there was small group instruction in the front end of the room, but for the kids to get to the STI, small group instruction in the back room, they had to walk through and disrupt the kids in the front. Okay, that's something that really shouldn't happen, but you need to provide the programs. And believe me, every, there are no programs that are not made available. I don't want to stress that. Nobody is deprived of anything in this district. The principals are very creative with the space. But again, aside from class size, number of rooms available, it also gives opportunities to provide to provide programs and spaces that are appropriate. Okay. Move on. Okay, so now the next group of tables. The next group of tables may be a little well you've got you've got documents so it's gonna be a little hard to read up here, but it may explain or address some of the some of the, the situations we talked about. So let's go to the next group. Alright? The first the first school this is the projection. This is the history and projection of Mills. Okay, Mills had Mills has um, self-contained special education classes in it. Mills went from a total of 392 students in 2012-13 to 476 in 2017-18, which was quite an increase. Okay, the projection is that Mills will go to about 513 children in total, going out to 2017-18. Uh, uh, so if Mills is, uh, no, I'm sorry, to, 2021-23. So if Mills is at capacity now in a K-5, how does Mills increase by another 40 or so students with the same with the same capacity? Impossible, well, not impossible because principals make things work, but not desirable. So let's go to the next slide, please. So here, here is a five-year, here is a five-year projection based upon room utilization. The first column in each of these, it's 2018-19, 2019, 2020-21, 2021-22, 2022-23. Not 34, that's a change. It says 34, it's 23-23. Okay, sorry about that. But anyway, the first column shows the number of students that are, that are projected for each of the years. For example, in 2018-19, 76, then 69, uh, 101 third graders, 91 fourth graders, and uh, 76 fifth graders, and 10 self-contained kids. The next column multiplies that by 25, 
Well, divide, divide the first column by 25. So if you take a look, okay, we're at 3.04. We're just slightly over, over the need for uh, three classrooms. So we put three classrooms there. And as you go down the list, but if you go down the list, you'll see the roundup for each particular grade. Now, what the fractions mean, this is what the fractions mean in that second column means that there is room to grow until you need to add another classroom. But the problem is that in most cases you don't have the classroom to add. So there are a total of 27 rooms in Mills. Okay? Required, again, let's just stay with the first column, because then you can make sense out of the rest of the columns or the rest of the charts. So in order to service special education, self-contained special education, and uh, general education, 23 full-size rooms are needed. So that leaves four, that leaves a difference of four rooms, uh, for four rooms in a K-Y basis, but we've got, uh, in that building, we have ESL and bilingual, takes up one full-size room. Uh, remedial reading takes up one full-size room. OTPT takes up one full-size room. And speech takes up one full-size room. So, because, and I can correct the moment, is it no art on a cart? Yes, yeah. art music on a cart. Because there's no, so, so when we talked about it before, if we can pick up room that may be able to add an art room and or a music room, that would work. So let's go, so let's go to the next, next. Okay, so now, in K4, oh, can you go back one place? Okay, if you take a look down here, if the program stayed the same, the class sizes stayed the same, no goes, no goes from minus one to minus three to minus four to minus two to minus two <coughs> in, in, the, in the projection. Now let's go to the next table, please. In a K-4 environment, okay, in a K-4 environment, keeping everything the same, first of all, keeping the class sizes, but keeping everything, keeping everything the same, including Four specialty rooms, specialized rooms, uh, OTPT, speech, remedial reading, ESL, bilingual. It leaves two available. It leaves two available rooms that could be used for art, could be used for music, or could be used to uh, split a program if necessary. But that's that's the judgment of the educators in the district how they want to use it. But it gives a K four gives Mills an opportunity to to create and provide these programs. The next slide, please. Okay. okay. Forest. Okay. Forest was stable. Forest has remained stable um, for the for the projection period. It was 280, 200, a total of 285 students in 2012-13, and it's 286 in 2017-18. So that's flat. Okay. On project, the projections are showing an increase to about 319 students going out to 2000. Going into 2022-23. Okay, next slide, please. So again, if we take a look at a K-5, at a K-5 situation, uh, Forest has, in one year, it could possibly, possibly have an available classroom. Uh, and going out the rest of the years, it's it's full, it's full, it's a full house. Now, Forest does have an art room, and Forest does have a music room. However, all of all other programs, and I believe. Uh, there used to be four special, four cell event rooms. No, I'm yeah. sorry. That, well, that's what we got. Four cell contained rooms. So with that, they do have an art room and they do have a music room, but every other specialized pro, every other program, including resource, including speech, ESL, uh, small group instruction, uh, they're all they're in small rooms. So again, if we go to the next slide, okay, we get. We get a we get three we have three open classrooms with three classrooms available for the program in, in Forest in 2018-19. We would have three uh, in 2019-20, uh, two in 2020-21, two in 2021-22, and two in 2022-23. Yes. And so the question is, you were saying um, Looking at your charts with the special ed stuff, how it's small rooms. Now, when you say small no, rooms, self-contained is not self-contained full-size rooms by law. Okay. Okay. The other rooms are small rooms. Okay. Which I, that's what I'm talking about. The small rooms are not regulation classrooms, correct? 
Well, this, they're classing the generally under 500 square feet. Okay. Now, you can't put a, a, a full size I house. Know. Uh, my question is, what happens if the special needs group grows in that particular school? Do you have the room to put them in a general classroom? Is that included in the study? No, they're, these are self-contained. And not, they, they may be in, 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 in programs like art, music, gym, you know, in general ed, but these are kids who are self-contained. They're not in general education classrooms during the day. They're not in their core subjects. Okay, well, my question is, again, if we have an overabundance of special needs children that have to be in that school for those programs, do we have the rooms for them? Are we going to pick it up? Like, you know, if you say to yourself, I mean, how is that figured in? I'm just curious because what happens if, you know, we're in a self-contained room, small room, whatever, they can only fit 10 kids, but we really need a room now for 16 kids. Do we have that space or do we lose that and lose art out of the room and we go back to art on the cart? I'm just trying to verify this. Well, well, first of all, I know nothing's exact, so I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Don't no, me. no. Well, I'm just curious yeah. with these questions. It, it, it's, it's almost an unanswerable question in terms okay. of the fact you cannot project year to year what your special needs population is going to be. Because they're tested every year, kids test out, kids test in. Um, I think that, that, that and again, um, you know, there's this, this a little bit of art to this as well as science, and I think that we're creating enough access access space enough built in there that we could find other we could move programs we, if they're a district-wide program and the space you know if we're you know i i am speculating but let's say that we have three three oh, two open rooms here we might take a district-wide special needs program and put it there so i think that the taking out taking the fifth grade out of the elementary schools creates along with the amount of rooms it creates a lot more flexibility for building Next slide, please. Okay. Lincrest. Lincrest showed an increase going from 219 to 252, and the projection out is to about 278. Um, Lincrest doesn't have any self-contained special education children, so let's look at the Next slide, please. Okay. On a K-5 basis, you can see because the population is growing, full house next year, full house the year after. Oh, we have a question. Yes. Step up to the mic. Yes. Okay. So sitting next to my neighbor, this is the point I think you're trying to make. If you go back to the Milne's projection, okay. Um, the K five historical, right? Okay. Okay. That's it. Go back one. Okay. One more. No. Further. One back. Perfect. Okay. okay. So. I think the question she's trying to ask, because she asked, she said if I could ask it, I'd try. So if you look at the historical data, the growth projections from 2012 every year from K, 35 to 56 is like a 60% growth. To right? Because it's the cohort, right? You get the 35K at 2012-13, yes sir? To the equals the 56. Oh, 35 right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right? <coughs> equals to 56, 1, 62, 2, and 66, right there. So it grows by 60% from K to 1, 10% from 1 to 2, relatively flat, okay? And then your projections... Can I ask the numbers? Can you give me the numbers that you're doing that? Let me, let me explain something. Yeah. In 2012, 13, kindergarten was a half a day. So what we found historically, uh -huh. that half a day kindergarten was usually much less than when they got into first grade because a lot of people would not put their kids in a half-day kindergarten. So the huge jump from 35 to 56 at Mills, I, I, part of it I'm sure was you know births, but also we found that through the years, I don't know the numbers, but there was always about a hundred child increase throughout the district from kindergarten to first grade when we had it was about half a It was about a 50% growth on average from kindergarten First grade, it's about a 50 percent growth on average. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, and then because we only had half day kindergarten, so kids kids would be either put in a different, you know, in a private kindergarten or something, and then but then when first grade came around and they could do be there full day, the parents would pull them out of the private program and put them into our first grade. So that's the huge jump from K to one in the early years. You're not going to see that anymore because they're full day now. Okay. So whatever. No, let me. Ask, I got to ask you a question before you ask your question. What numbers are you taking me the increase? Are you going vertically, horizontally, or diagonally? Diagonally, sir. Okay. I'm, I'm 
I'm trying to. And don't use kindergarten or first grade because it's not valid in, in the first five because of half day to full day. Okay, so full day started this year? Last year. Okay. Okay. okay, so, okay, so forgetting that just for a moment because that's new information, I was just trying to do the math. Okay, to, to Mr. Vance's point, I understand half day to first, but I'm just going by the numbers, okay? So you had a 60% increase in K1, regardless of whether it was half day to first, first grade. But then your projections for 18, 19, 20 through 23, so you have 76 students in kindergarten projected for next year. That growth rate to first grade is not, again, to Because grade, it's full time. You're going full time. You're going from a full time kindergarten to a full time first grade. So you go, and so those numbers are going to be a whole lot closer. So because because if you go full if you go full time first grade, people are going to utilize the full time first grade. So if you if, 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 if so 76 to 79, 82 to 82, 77 to 76, 76 to 80 is a reflection of full time kindergarten to first grade. Okay. The projections let, let, again. Let me finish. Yes, sir. The projections prior to that had to be done by doing an averaging between kin between uh, between birth and first grade. And then making some weighting to the kindergarten numbers because uh, I'll give you an example. There was a projection done prior to this, prior to my doing it. Uh, there was a projection done where the demographer neglected to recognize the the jump in the, the jump between kindergarten and first grade between 2016 and 17. It resulted in an overage of almost 400 kids on the outside. Okay, projection. So then, really, the historical data from 2012, based on a half-day kindergarten program shouldn't factor in because as you say people either did or did not use the program but then the first you should look at the first grade numbers right right but you, you can't just leave kindergarten out i know what you're saying but you know, I have to discount it or, or give some kind of uh, credence to the fact that it was not a really a valid increase okay based on our numbers. We're getting, we're getting, i understand no let, let me so just then, so uh, then if you use the first grade numbers because that's a full day system the growth rate is still relatively flat. No, it's check. really not. It's not flat. Wait, wait a second. It's not. It's not. It, wait, wait. It's five to ten percent. So it's not flat. Let me let me be very clear. Okay, just sir. The only place where an adjustment had to be made, okay, was between 2016-17 kindergarten and 2017-18. Because, and so we may we only use these two years with some weighting. Okay, we had to. We didn't. We didn't count in the um, in the average increase the years prior to that because they would have invalidated. They would have invalidated the numbers. For example, if you took 326. I'm sorry, uh, births. If you took 326 births to 50 kindergarten kids, okay, that would create a huge, huge number. The multiplier would be invalid. So what we did was we used this year and this year, but two years aren't the best. You need at least three. So we waited a third year in there. Okay, and as you see, now we're talking birth. We're able to use birth rate, these kids born in 2013, to create a kindergarten number. And then we go across. So there's no discrepancy. Okay. I want to ask, under what assumption is are these numbers where the kids at Radburn Crossing, so it used to be called Landmark, but then they sold it to another developer, so now it's called uh, Radburn Crossing, right? So are those kids just sprinkled throughout the six elementary schools, or have you placed them in some other places? Okay. They, when, when you see the Radburn projection, okay, I'm not, we don't know where we're placing those kids. So I've got 73 kids saying, in the Radburn, so there's no confusion when you get to the Radburn sign, so 73 students, elementary school students, may come from the landmark development. Radburn doesn't have the space to put them in. Then it becomes the board's decision as to where to put them, but, but in the analysis of the whole study, you can absorb those 73 kids. How do you absorb them? That's above my paper. But those 73 elementary school students in your numbers right now are on the assumption that they would go to Radburn Elementary School. They're not on that. They're just sprinkled they're, around. They're not sprinkled anywhere. It's 73 students. 
what I'm saying in the projection is that look at the overall space in all of the buildings and the board that has to assess where these students are going. Okay. They're in, the 73 students are in the projection, the district projection. Okay, if you go, well, you have to go back, they're in the total district projection, okay, as opposed to the, the they're in the table with landmark, they're not in the table without landmark. The question is, there are 73 students, and they're, they're included in the projection, they're just not located in the projection. But you have the projected number of kindergartners and not. He hasn't put them in a school yet, because we don't know what school they're going. Is that correct, Ross? That's absolutely So they, they are just kind of like out of there. But when you calculate how many free spaces you're going to have in your space utilization, there's 73 students whose spaces are not accounted for in these numbers. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. That. The, the spaces are not assigned. I don't want to be a politician and give you a crazy answer. The spaces are not allocated on those. It, 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 they're not allocated to any particular school. It's 73 students. By the way, which you know, spread over three years, spread over five grades. Okay? Think about it. Okay? It's, you're not... When, if, if you buy my objection that it's 73 kids, it's not 73 kids coming in next Tuesday. It's 73 kids spread out over the last three years over in a K-4 over five grades and a K-6 over six grades. So it's not a huge amount of students. Given what the board is doing in terms of production of, of space in the elementary schools, the district should easily be able to absorb those 73 students. Where they absorb them, and in what year they absorb them, that's their decision. I can only tell you the number of kids coming in, but I can't tell you where they should be. Okay, thank you. I know it's not the most satisfactory answer, but it's an honest answer. Okay, the next, next one, please. Oh, go down to the blue. Uh, okay, so let's go to Lindcrest. Okay, so Lindcrest went from 219 to 252, and it's going to you're going to project out to 278. Let's see in K-5. Next slide, please. In K-5, um, full house up through 2020, 2021. Then uh, in 2000, and a short one, a shortage of one in 2020, 2021. A shortage of one in 2021-22. And a shortage of three in 2022, uh, in 2022-23. And if you're wondering why we're going from one one to all of a sudden three, remember the concept of breakage? It depends on how the numbers break in a grade level. So you can have in a given year two extra classrooms and another given year be minus two extra classrooms. Again, depending on how the grade levels break and where you want to keep your class sizes. Keep in mind, I cap all of these class sizes at 25. Again, just so, you know, you know, it, it, would you split 26? Would you split 20? I mean, I don't know, it's not my decision. But 25 is the targeted class size for the school district. Okay? And that's the class size that I followed in this project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and in K4 in Lincrest, we pick up, we pick up two, 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 one, and one. So Lincrest and Lincrest has an art room, it has a band room, it has a child study room. So Lincrest has large rooms dedicated to doing a number of uh, of different kinds of programs. Next slide. No question. Yeah. Yeah, what makes me a little nervous about this is that there's some inconsistencies in the way that you, you round it off. Um, Lindcrest, for example, with the third graders, I guess K through four and 21, 22, you get 50 students, so you have two rooms. But if you look at the K through five, you have 50 students, and so you get three rooms. I didn't know if there was a reasoning behind that or if that's just If they a, went over the, if, again, if they went, well, no, the, the ones, uh, go back, uh, go back. No, like in Lindcrest K through five, third grade, three, okay. 50 students, two rooms, actual three. And so that accounts for minus three I, instead of minus okay, two. I, I, say it again, because I'm kind of missing what you're saying. They, I, I've got, I don't have any classes going. I've got a fifth grade that is 51 kids. I assigned right, three rooms. So, okay, but that's not what I'm talking about. So number. Lindcrest 20, well it says 21, 2021-23, which I guess is not correct, but um, third grade, 52 rooms, and it says actual three, and then you go to K through four, and it says two rooms, actual two. Okay, but keep in mind what I said. I said I made, I made the chart great at 25. Yeah. 51 gives three classrooms, again. I said 50, so which is 25, which should be two actual rooms, correct? Which grade? Third grade. Oh, here? The last one, you're right there. 
probably you push because the, the, the XL AP 50.01, it does, so in that case, in that case for that year, if you want to take away that one, where is it going here? One room, so you're minus two. You're still minus. Okay, but the next one, a like year before, the same 50 has two October. You didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, 50, I have two. Yeah, I have to use two. No, it, 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 it's, it could have been a function of Excel, but these are one more made. Sometimes Excel takes one character over. But again, so instead of minus, instead of minus two, it's minus two, it's still minus. And it's, again, um, if that's the one we found out of all of these, not too bad. But I mean, again, um, it, it, the major point is it's short, they're still short in that building. Next slide, please. Okay, Radburn. Let's try to address this here. Radburn went from 365 to 458, so that's like a 93 kid increase, and it's looking to go up at least another 30 kids. And again, the, the uh, landmark, or whatever it's now called, is smack in the middle of the Radburn attendance zone. But what I'm saying here, by not putting them in the Radburn, uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is Radburn does not have the space, clearly does not have the space to handle it. So those 73 children will have to be distributed somehow by the board, reassigned by the board, by some methodology. Okay. Okay. Again, that's not in my study at this, at this point. So let's go to the next one, please. If we take a look at Radburn, and again, just to prove the point, again, to stay with the point as to why Radburn can't handle those, those students, in 2018-19, they'd be minus one. They go all the way out. The next four years of the, of the projection shows that Radburn is short three. And, and again, I want to point out that there's some places where you have 2.96 rooms, but the actual is four. And, and a, on a couple of places on this chart, I just, like I said, as a, as a resident, it worries me to see these inconsistencies on, this, on, on, the, on the demographic study that we're going to base a lot of stuff on. If you go through, there's Two point uh, in, in 2018-19, fifth grade 2.96, actual three. In second grade 2019-2020, 2.96, actual four. Um, that's one other place. Yeah, then in 2021-22, 2.96 rooms, actual four. You know, I, I just like I said, I, I mean, maybe there's a education no, reason behind that that I don't understand, but I think I understand this. Again, again. Um, we can go back and take a look and make the adjustment. However, it's still going to be a shortfall in each one of those grades by two classrooms. So the shortfall is there. None of these things are going to be. So let's take one year in particular. Let's say we change uh, in 2019-20. We take that 296, we drop it. We drop three in the third grade, which makes, which makes uh, three in the uh, second grade, which makes sense to me. We're still minus two. So again, we'll, tomorrow morning, we will adjust, we will adjust any of those need to be adjusted. Okay. You know, I'm just worried about the consistency that I'm seeing here. You know, again, we need to, this needs to be a credible study that's going to move on before you can sit the base on it. I'm not feeling that. Okay, I can't, you know, I'm sorry, the other way, the, uh, there are, if we cut a couple of, a couple of really relatively minor errors, uh, we'll correct them. Uh, again, clearly 2.96 should be 3, from saying out front, mismaking that change for whatever reason. But it still gets that shortfall of three, of two. It's still a shortfall. And if you look at all of the other numbers. It's not a shortfall next year, though, because two point word number number one. Yes. Uh, it's not really a question. I'm, I'm just, um, I, I, I agree with what he's saying. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm getting concerned that one room here, one room there, because of the, of the rounding, that's a full classroom. Oh, I, yeah, I understand. So, okay, I, I'm, I'm concerned as well okay. about about the rounding and the number of the classrooms okay. being inconsistent. Okay, here we'll find how many cases there are, and we'll go we'll go from there. Yeah, I don't think I'm sorry, but I agree with David. I agree with Cindy. Um, to me, to tell you the truth, this is a disaster tonight because I because of what you're, the way this is presented. 
I know it's not. And I trust. Like nothing, there was nothing new here that I didn't know. Like I knew that Bradburn wasn't going to be able to absorb Landmark or Bradburn Crossing. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed. I, I, I'm sorry. And I know, I know Mr. Bant is upset that I said that, but I'm disappointed. There's no reason to be, as I said, as I said, there, there are, whatever, the, whatever those rounding errors are, we'll, we'll change them, fix them. I, I, I will say this, I mean, there's a couple of mistakes, but disaster, Mike, all right, that's all I'm saying. Okay, I'll continue on. I just want to say that. Um, being I just want to say, being someone that uses Excel, like if you would have gone out maybe to um, put more of the points in you might be able to see it better because like in the one column where it says you know that it's 78 students and then it's 3.12 rooms it's actually four if it takes over you know if we want because we have policy that says you know no more than 25 right and if it's kindergarten we split it to 13 and 13 but it, the program doesn't know that you, you know what i mean so the program is saying that it's three rooms when it really could be two rooms if it's a if it's a, a fifth well, that's grade, manually correct. That's what I mean. If that's it's a fifth manually. grade, then then it, it could be 26, and, yeah. and you wouldn't need the extra room. Right. So I think that might be part of the issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right. Next. Next. Um, next one. Okay. Warrant point went from 406 to 463, <laughs> and then up to 476. So Warren Point has shown considerable growth in that period of time. Let's go to the next table. And again, Warren Point, um, I'm just checking here. I want to make sure. Yeah, this Warren Point should be zero. Which grade? Okay, okay. It's, a, it's zero. Okay. And in the following year, are we okay in the following year? Yeah, it should be zero as well. Okay. Zero, zero, okay. It has to be changed. I'm not going to defend it, I mean, it just has to be changed. Okay? The, the projected numbers are correct. We've got to just, I've just got to change those that didn't round up properly. Again, my fault for not proofreading it effectively enough. Next. Um, Again, here we show the excess in each, in, in each grade level. I'm not sure if, I, if there's any problems here. See any here? Okay. okay next one. In Westmoreland, went from 261 to, 330, to 311 to 331. So it showed over a 10 year period, Westmoreland's. Uh, uh, showing a considerable amount of growth. So we go from 261 to 311, and from 311 to 331. Go to the next table, please. And two, three. Okay, so Westmoreland is one, zero, um, minus two, minus two, minus two. So in a K5, Westmoreland is showing a shortage in the future years, and let's go to K4. K4, um, Westmoreland picks up two, one, zero, one, and zero. So there's, so it picks up some, some classrooms in there uh, over the period of next year. So, okay, so, um, okay, next slide, please. Okay. okay. Um, I Westmoreland, I have a question. Yeah. Um, we just built up that school. How should we? Short at that school, what the projections are that, that over like when they're going up 311 to 331, you're adding 20 kids. What were your projections? So, how could you be short like two classrooms or two 
Oh, correct. So I'm apologizing. I don't have my glasses, my reading glasses. Like, uh, this you don't have to go away. Okay. Which slide? Okay. Well, I know. I'm just saying. Like on this one, you have you have 311, and then you're you're saying that we're going to project out to 331. So that's 20 kids. We just did a, a, a an addition there to take, to take care of the art on the card, who's on the card, and all the kindergarten and everything else. So you're saying we're short two classrooms there. But at the end of the day, we're going to short two classrooms. We'll take a look at the. We take a look at the um, at the grade range and the class again. Remember, I'm keeping 25. Okay, in each of these grade levels, I'm keeping the class average. We've got actually got one up here at 26, uh, but it's it's, I mean, it's it depends on where the grade levels break. Brian, 20 kids can add five kids in four grade levels, right? Brian, you're not short the first two years. Brian, excuse me. The first two years should be zero. So you're not short. That's why that was a question. That's Brian. Why? I, I think we moved a lot of programs into Westmoreland once we did the addition. So that's part of it. All right, well, I just want to check on that. Okay, uh, Edison, uh, Edison has a special education program as well as the offices of the Home for Bed. Uh, as such, the building is fully utilized. In this much, there's no room, there is a projected room, even with expansion to accommodate special education students in elementary schools. The only alternative would be to send these children out of district, out of district places, which both not educationally or emotionally sound for these kids, but it's very expensive and yearly as a yearly course in the district. So the point being is that Edison should remain as it is, uh, sharing special education and uh, administration. So, okay, now. The uh, Thomas Jefferson Middle School will need 14 classrooms to accommodate grade five general and special education students. Uh, the room estimates are based upon a maximum class size of 25 for general ed classes. So if we take a look, if we take, and again, extract it from these specialized rooms. This is only general education, uh, general education classrooms um, for core courses, used for core courses. So if we take the 2018, uh, at 25 kids to a class, uh, you would actually need about 30 classrooms for a Jefferson. If in 2018 we added the, um, the fifth grade, you would need 41, which is a plus 11. But keep in mind that, as someone said early, early, early in the audience, we have to um, allow for special needs rooms. We have to allow, as we're increasing the enrollment in those schools, we have to allow for expansion of resource room, self-contained special ed. And going down the line, uh, and they'll need to go to a K, K a 5-8 uh, of 10 rooms in 2000, uh, in 2019, um, 13 rooms in 2020, uh, an additional 11 rooms in 2000, uh, in 2012, in 2000, uh, 2021, and 11 rooms in 2022-23 uh, again. The 14 allows for growth, and the 14 allows for uh, for special ed and resource rooms to accommodate any special needs of those populations. And again, excluded from this are specialized rooms. Next slide. There are quite a few inconsistencies in this particular slide. Because if you look at 2019 actual rooms, you're looking at 10.08 equals 10. But if you look down at four down from there, it's 10.4, it equals 11. And then if you look down further from there in sixth grade, you have 10.68 equals 12. Right, okay. Just making sure that you're going to. Yes. Make the yeah, we're gonna go through all of these charts. Yeah, okay. Uh, Memorial? Next, go, go back.
Back. Oh, here's one more. Do you need to go back to Judges? Oh, okay. Memorials are going to need nine additional classrooms to accommodate those grades. And uh, they will go from 18 to 24 in 2018-19. Um, in and 2019-20, well, again, we're not doing these till the out here. So in 2020, assuming that's in the year, that we're going to need at least six uh, additional classrooms. Um, uh, in 2021-22, uh, we need an additional seven. And in 2022-23, an additional six. But again, the additional classrooms you're building would be to accommodate any kind of special programs that bringing an additional grade level will hold. Please go to the next one. And so, conclusion. Uh, the projection show the projection shows the elementary school can show a shortfall of between four and as many as ten by 2022-23. Uh, if that needs to be corrected, when we correct the tables, I will correct that. The projection shows that with fifth grade moving to the middle school, there will be an effective gain of about 18 rooms in the elementary school. But again, we um, will see how that holds up when I when I when I make corrections. Uh, Landmark is projected to add 73 students to the elementary schools. It is currently located in the Radburn attendance zone, but the projection indicates that Radburn will not be able to accommodate this population. Uh, it appears that a K-4 organization will allow the schools to accommodate future enrollments that will be sustainable, and the addition of 14 rooms at Jefferson and 9 Memorial by adequate classroom space based upon the projections of the expansion of Thomas Jefferson. Will, uh, with the expansion, Thomas Jefferson should be able to absorb the 23 students projected from the landmark or the Radford and Landmark development. And with that, uh, aside from the fact that I apologize for any of the errors in this report, I'm open to other questions. Um, I just want to add that based on the community response, it seems pretty obvious that when you're sharing a good amount of data like this, it would be extremely useful for the parents and the audience to have some fans. We're talking about even four hours in advance. It doesn't have to be 24 days in advance because the reaction here is pretty obvious that a lot of this could be managed well before the meeting. So be under fire. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But, you know, the other day I was looking at, you know, some of the information on the district website on referendums. And I began thinking, okay, let's go back a bit and where we were to where we are today. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, 25 years ago, we did, TJ was not open. Memorial was 7th and 8th grade. And if you take a look at the numbers of Memorial right now, I wish I had a chart for this one. Uh, currently, they have, according to the student enrollment from the board website from last month, 424 students. So that would be grades 6, 7, and 8. So you currently have 424 students. But teach, uh, Memorial was at one point 7th and 8th grade only. And if you take a look at all of our 7th and 8th graders today, that would be 749 students. So you're looking at an increase of about 76.6%. I was going to round up, but I don't want to round tonight. Uh, so it's 76.6% increase. So my question is, where would those students go if we did not have the space of TJ? Now granted, this is going back and seeing where we've come. In addition to that, when we take a look at sixth grade, if we did not have that space available, and this is why I always say, never say no to more space, what would it look like if we did not have that available? Where would we put sixth graders? In buildings that have no room. So as we're making projections going forward, if we go back far enough, we can see where we are today, and this is only at a 25-year window. 
and we need that space. And right now we are busting at the seams, even with that additional expansion. Uh, Mary, your memorial 25 years ago, was it? I'm asking you to go back in time. Was it a little bit crowded back then? Even with just seventh and eighth grade? It was just seventh and eighth grade, but it was crowded. So then I thought to myself, okay, you know, if you took the number of students and divided by the number of classrooms, it would be about 25 students per room, but that would be every room being used every period, which is unrealistic. So then the other is, you know, you, I was just doing some rough figures, and in reality, you would have about 33 students per class, or you would have to hire about 12 to 13 additional teachers. Just to, And then where would everyone need to work, to plan, to conference? So we are really looking at a situation from where we've been to where we've come today, and we see where the numbers are going. They're only going higher. In addition to that, so I hope that gives people some perspective, not only the where we are going in the direction, but the history and the pattern of where we've come from. The other thing, and I don't mean this to be um, disrespectful to another district, but there is another district that has a referendum that they're voting on that's calling for a $70.4 million referendum for expansion. And with that one, it's not in Bergen County, but when I looked at the numbers and what it is that they're getting, it's um, 32 classrooms versus 23. So they're only getting 39% more classrooms, but their referendum is 192% higher. And of course, it's not apples to oranges. It's more like honey due to cantaloupe because you really are looking at just more space. And there are some things that are some niceties that they have, but you know, in the end, I think that we're we're doing very well, and then the hit for taxpayers there is 200% more. There are a lot of numbers coming out, but when you look at it, yes, the space is needed. We see how crowded it is, but if we go back in time, and I hope this helps the community put things in perspective, that again, if we were going back to today, the memorial would be unsustainable. I don't think it's got to be like that on that front, or, or any of the elementary principles, because where would you put everyone? So uh, sometimes we need to look at things just a little bit differently with the perspective, and uh, again, I thank the board for everything that they're doing, uh, and for the presentation tonight, and for the people who are watching, and uh, who came out tonight for that. Thank you, Gene. I just want to conclude by encouraging everybody to look at the big numbers that have been projected out. So although we were taking a micro look at classroom utilization, if you look at the big numbers that have been projected, um, we're looking at enrollment history and projection. This is on page seven. Despite all of the conversations we had tonight, and I think there were healthy conversations, what we do know is that there will be 5,441 students in just a few years in our schools. That's the big number we need to keep focusing in on. The, the question that has been posed and that we continue to pose is, the issue is not, are they coming? We know that they are coming. The cohort analysis component of this really is on target. Similar numbers to what another demographic report showed. What we had our conversations about is rounding up within how you use individual classrooms. But let's not lose track of the fact that we're going up to five, over 5,400 kids. Now, it does not include our special ed out of district population. And I know earlier also, we were looking at what's the, what's the current population here. You've heard me at many meetings talk about 5,000 25. But remember that these tables do not include out-of-district students, but 5,441 kids in just a few years. And the reality is, if we don't have this referendum approved, there's no place for them to go. There's just no place for them to go. But I do thank everyone for the conversations, and we have more comments. Just a quick question. <clears throat> Quick question, has, has any of this been projected also to the high school? 
to see whether or not when this wave of students hits this building, whether or not um, we're going to be ready for that. Because I hate to have that upon us and then say, oh, by the way, now the high school's overcrowded and we don't have space for that. So I was hoping maybe we can get an answer to that uh, <coughs> to either prepare or to alleviate uh, fears that we have that yeah. we're just going to run into this same problem later on uh, here. It, I'll be, provide, I'll be providing um, full tables, which will have the high school enrollment. Uh, and the high school enrollment uh, over time, I'm not going to quote them, the high school should be, well, it will be fine based upon the numbers over the next five to seven years. Uh, and further, I, I, don't, I don't see for a long, over the long term the high school being uh, Im impacted. But wait till you, it's not, you won't see an individual high school table in here, but I will make sure you have those tables by the end of the week. Remember, the, the primary focus for me on this study was the K-8. I understand. Yeah, no. That, that question wasn't really for you, sir, it was more for uh, the board, just to keep that in mind. Any other board members? Yeah. Okay. okay, I think uh, everyone has had a say. I want to thank everyone for coming. Dr. Haber, thank you very much. Board members, members of the audience, um, very informative meeting, and I think uh, Ernie was right. You cannot lose sight of what the real problem is. You have to see again the forest for the trees. You've got to see the forest for the trees, and I think that so uh, we have to keep on doing. So at this point, uh, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Like, all right, personnel committee meeting in um, B103 in five minutes. Thank you.